Thanks for joining us. Another edition of No Stop Lights. Want to once again thank our sponsors, Mickey Fins, Marlboro PD Electric, Schofields, Carolina Bank, Pepsi of Florence. Without these sponsors, none of this is possible, which, you know, you may say is not such a, no, it's not such a bad idea if none of this was, um, was possible. But I, um, God, I, I, really and truly, I mean, we're, we're new in the digital world, in the digital space. We solidified ourselves in what I'll call traditional media, conservative talk radio. We have evolved, we think, into a, um, a decent enough podcast. I uh, would love for you to subscribe to, and I'll let the, uh, the Rev explain to you how you can subscribe Thanks. and become a, um, a more devout supporter of this feeble attempt at podcasting. But I do want to make sure uh, I mentioned again how thankful we are of our sponsors. I would encourage our listeners to patronize and support these sponsors every chance you get. Mickey Finn's, uh, an alcohol wholesaler, beer, wine, um, and liquor. Marlboro Pity Electric, kind of an ambassador to economic development in the state of South Carolina. Schofield's Ace Hardware. Um, I remember visiting with Ron Lyles and crew over at Schofield's and, you know, we didn't know our ass from third base, but, but I knew that their shoppers would be our, our, um, listeners and eventually our, um, our viewers, Carolina bank, local bank, uh, unbelievably committed to the local economy. Um, you got to find a community bank that is willing to invest in, uh, in the local community, hence the name, um, community bank. Those guys have been around forever. We really and truly thank, uh, the Beasley family, Brian Falcone and some others, over at Carolina Bank that have been very supportive of um, of whatever it is here we're trying to do. And Pepsi of Florence, um, we, we joke around about the fast twitch and Celsius debate. Um, which 200 grams of caffeine are infused into your body in, in the, most, um, the most proper fashion? I don't know the answer to that. I just know doing a podcast with 200 grams of caffeine is a lot easier to do uh, in the afternoons than a podcast without 200 grams. <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, of caffeine. So thanks to Pepsi of Florence, Les Ward and all the fine folks over at Pepsi of Florence. But once again, um, you know, I, I guess you measure success or failure by how many subscribers you have. Um, we, we, we've baby stepped into the digital world. We've not had a grand opening because we're not sure that this is um, as good as we can do. It's as good as we can do right now, but we toy around with a lot of ideas. And, um, and one of the things we need is, uh, subscribers. We have a functioning way for people to subscribe. I just don't know it. I just, you know, what I do is, um, is basically run my mouth four hours in the morning and then for, uh, you know, a few minutes in the afternoon as we, um, as we do these podcasts twice a week and, um, Rev can tell you much better than I, how you can support our, um, our, our attempt. It's, uh, and I, I'm going to say this, we've not said it in a while, no stoplights, is a reference to my hometown. When I ran for lieutenant governor um, as a nobody from nowhere, I'm still a nobody from nowhere, but as a um, as a prohibitive nobody from nowhere, uh, one of the one of the catchphrases that um that I created contrast in my campaign for lieutenant governor of South Carolina is when I said, "I'm a college dropout from a town with no stoplight. Take what I say for what it's worth." And it kind of, I mean, it really, I mean, that's, that's my, I'm a college dropout from a town with no stoplight. I mean, the, you know, the inference is 100% accurate. So, um, we, we created the silhouette of the, uh, of the water tower. Uh, some of you have seen some of the, uh, some of the branding and marketing. There it is right uh, there. There, on there it is there. Uh, count on Rev to do exactly what needs to be done in the production fashion <laughs> of, uh, of no stoplights. Thank you. But, um, a lot of the old rural towns in the South were, um, known for their water towers. They became somewhat landmarkish in, in said town and um you know pamplico my hometown has a a very pronounced presence of a of a water tower name emblazoned on the on the side and um and the silhouette of the of the uh, the water tower from my hometown a town with no stoplights is kind of the um now uh, we, we thought was a uh, an interesting way to um uh, to, to to brand or market a point of view that really and truly comes from a, um, a rural upbringing. And, uh, you know, in the radio, we, we argue, ah, we don't argue. We, um, we declare ourselves the, um, the convergence of intellect and redneck. Um, I would argue a lot more redneck than, than intellect, but we sneak in a little serious, um, thought here and there, but, but I'll defer to Rev. He can, uh, expound upon how you can become a subscriber and be, um, given notice 
when we do um drop or download another podcast or publish as i like to say there you go download publish I'm going to make this very quick and snappy because I know you have some amazing content prepared for today's uh, I'll, episode. I'll, I'll take my time if you're waiting on amazing. No, it's going to be good. I know it is. Uh, but it's very easy. Wherever you're listening or viewing right now, just subscribe so you'll get notified whenever a new uh, podcast is published. Uh, and we try to do them a couple of times a week on a somewhat regular schedule. And we change that if there's breaking news or whatever. Um, and... We have an aggregator website that's ready that has uh, all the information you would need to know. No stoplights with Ken R.com. No stoplights with Ken R.com. Just go there and everything is right there, including some contact forms. You can send emails uh, to me. And uh, if you have, want sponsorship opportunities, we can take care of that with you right through the website. No stoplights with Ken R.com. And there are many days I sit down behind the microphone uh, deliberating what particular issue or topic. We're talking about today is a no-brainer. I mean, it really and truly is. Um, today is the day after the Durham report um, drops, and uh, well, you know, I'm not I'm not insinuating that people have to believe what I believe. I'm not arguing that people have to uh, interpret things the way that I've interpreted um, things. I, I'm a simpleton. I try to keep it real simple. So so let's let's land here to begin with. I mean, let, let's let's start here, and we'll find out where it goes from here in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, The FBI weighed in on a presidential election in politically biased fashion. But that's indisputable now. The Durham report is um, 306 pages. There's an executive summary. I've read the executive summary. I've read the Wall Street Journal. I've read National Review. I've read uh, the New York Times. I know the New York Times and Washington Post, the only times they've reported on the the steel dossier in Russia collusion was when they were awarded Pulitzer Prizes. Um, c- kind of an interesting afterthought there. Um, you're right about something that turns out to not be true, and you win a couple of Pulitzer Prizes because, once again, um, half the country despised Donald Trump and everything associated with, with Cheeto Jesus. But, I mean, I, I want to read th- th- this, this sentence, and, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, The FBI decided to engage in a politically biased fashion in the 2016 presidential election. Indisputable. Irrefutable. I mean, it happened. Now, now I want to go back to the the, the cast of characters. James Comey, Peter Strzok, Andy McCabe, John Brennan, um, James Clapper. I mean, all of these are political operatives. they, They disguise themselves as career bureaucrats. But, but in essence, they, they evolved in into political operatives. They've all ended up with television gigs and, you know, the, um, the national security analyst at CNN, uh, the national security analyst at MSNBC. Uh, but but I, I want to stick with the Hillary Clinton campaign decided to pitch the Steele dossier to the FBI, arguing that it was proof of the Trump campaign colluding with Russia to try to affect the outcome of the election. The, the richness of irony here is there was indeed Russia collusion. I mean, there is no doubt about it. It's indisputable once again that the Clinton campaign colluded uh, with, with Russia via the Steele dossier. Now, now, here's my problem. I don't have an issue with Hillary Clinton. I don't have an issue with Bill Clinton. I don't have an issue with Barack Obama. I don't have an issue with Joe Biden. I honestly and truly don't. Um, I've never thought those four people were ethical or moral. So, so why would I change my mind once I find out that Brennan sends an email to, to basically make aware of what's happening to Barack Obama? I mean, he does nothing about it. I mean, do you really believe the Clintons are bothered by being found out the shenanigans they were? No, of course not. Politicians go politic. I mean, that's just the nature of the business. Um, I mean, the Clintons, I mean, let's look at the Clintons track record. So Bill and Hillary Clinton are the most amazing entrepreneurs in the history of mankind. How do we know that, Rev? Because Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came after Microsoft. The Henry Ford Foundation came after Ford Motor Company. The Clintons are so innovative and entrepreneurial, they created a foundation and then got wealthy. So to believe or be surprised that Bill and Hillary were willing to make up a story and pitch it to the FBI 
should not surprise anyone. They are the Clintons. They are political prostitutes. They will do anything imaginable or unimaginable, ethical or unethical, moral or amoral, to win a campaign. That's who the Clintons are. So when someone says, wow, can you believe Hillary Clinton paid for the Steele dossier and made available the Steele dossier to the FBI? Of course I can. I would expect that from the Clintons. Once again, politicians going politic, prostitutions, I mean, the prostitutes going prostitute. I mean, that's just, you're not going to stop them from ever um, doing that. Here's the, the concern that we all should have. And I'll tell you, the, the, the alarm as the day has grown is how many people are unwilling to be as alarmed as I think America should be in general with what the FBI decided to do. Once again, the Clinton campaign paid for a dossier that was not substantiated, could not be corroborated, could not be legitimized, could not be um, defended for its accuracy or truth. The FBI decided to launch an investigation on the premise that it's not opposition research, but rather credible information that shows Trump colluded with Russia. Um, I mean, there's a lot of fancy lingo here. I mean, there's a lot of um, lawyer talk and, and, and political speak here. But at the end of the day, the only thing you need to remember of the 306-page um, Durham report and the 12-page executive summary is that the FBI decided to involve itself in a presidential election. Not just involve itself by making sure the elections are kept safe. No, that there was a political bias here. The, the FBI and CIA, to some degree, decided it was okay to decide um, who should be the president or have a hand in deciding who should be the next president of the United States. Now, now I don't believe it ended at 16. I think the witch hunt continued into 2020. Um, I think it probably affected the 2020 outcome. I was thinking about, uh, you know, words matter. I mean, words matter a lot. And here's what I wish America First would start referring to as the 2016 election or the 2020 election. The word stolen implies a degree of certainty. Let me ask you a question, Rev. Are you sure the 2020 election was stolen I can't say that. Well, I mean, you, no, nobody's sure. I mean, right. we talked about statistical anomalies. We, we talked about, you know, turnouts. We talked about uh, private financing of, of uh, elections. We talked about unsolicited bail-in ballots. We talked about ballot harvesting. But nobody's sure. Yeah. I mean, I the think some, some things are a little had fishy. Had it not have happened, right? They're, they're fishy and unexplainable. Well, I mean, there you go. A, a lot of suspicion. But, but we can no longer question whether the election was corrupt. I mean, let, let's stop saying stolen. I mean, you can believe it was stolen. But, but we, we, America first, and I'm an America first, or I say we, inclusive of the America first political movement, for, for the America first movement to be successful in 24, the word stolen does not need to leave our lips. But it's undeniable now. Once again, we can argue how much effect or impact the private financing of campaigns had. How much effect or impact uh, solicited, unsolicited mail-in ballots? How much effect or not uh, the, the, um, the Zuckerberg money and the ballot harvesting in these five or six or seven swing states? I mean, I, I believe that it's hard to explain the st statistical anomalies, but, but to your point, I can't prove the election was stolen, so I'm not going to say the election was stolen. I want to speak in facts. And the Durham report makes it a fact that the 2016 election was corrupt. The 2020 election was corrupt. And if you're a Democrat, if you're a never-Trumper, I mean, I understand um, the, the coldest mindset. And I've said this before. I am sick and tired of America First and Trump world being labeled a cultist. I mean, they, you know, they, they're a cult. I mean, they're loyal beyond belief. I mean, Trump doesn't have a base. He has a following. I mean, he's like a, um, it's like a prophet. You know, it's like Jesus and his followers and disciples and apostles. You know, I am a Trump supporter, but I'm a bigger supporter of America first. But I'm not part of a cult. I don't have a blind loyalty to a person or a political cause. The never Trumpers, after having this information made available, who don't accept that this legitimizes the argument that we've made for, what, seven years now? That the 2016 election was corrupt. 
The 2018 midterms were corrupt. The 2020 presidential election was corrupt. The 2022 midterms were corrupt. And damn it, the people that corrupted it are not the media. The media has a right to corrupt the elections. But the media has every right in the world to pick sides, to be to, to favor one side over the other. We know the majority of newsrooms in America are occupied by liberals. We accept that. Now, now we don't like the fact that it's gotten so rampant and so monolithic. We'd rather see that the old days of kind of a wink and a nod, but but a true uh, a, a true attempt to be journalistic in nature. We know that's not the case any longer. But th- you know, I don't know that the media has an obligation to be fair minded. I don't know if the media has an obligation to present both sides with equal legitimacy. Once again, uh, Hillary Clinton, I'm not surprised. Bill Clinton, not surprised. Barack Obama, not surprised. Uh, You know, Dick Cheney would have probably done the same thing. The Bushes probably would have done the same thing. Uh, Richard Nixon did something very similar to this. Um, The concern that I hope America has is a an executive agency within the federal government decided to put its hand, well, they didn't put their hand, they sat their big fat ass on the scale and tried to tip it in favor of one candidate over another. And guys, that is alarming. I mean, that's third world stuff. I mean, th- these are the things we read about in some of these uh, countries and economies and places that, that, that you know, uh, freedom does not reign and, and, and personal liberties does not carry uh, the day. And, and, it, it's it's alarming and troubling, and I struggle with the fact that so many people out there are saying, well, I mean, Durham took five or four years, and Durham spent $6 million, and there was no indictment, no arrest, no criminal charge. It doesn't matter. I mean, forget arrest, forget criminal charge, forget, I mean, focus on the word corruption. Forget stolen for a second. The 2016 election was corrupted by the Federal Bureau of Investigations and the Central Intelligence Agency. The 2018 midterms, likewise, were corrupted by that profound government agency, the 2020 presidential, the 2022 midterms. Now, now the the FBI says we made the changes necessary to make sure this never happens again. And and I'll tell you, the, the, the silence is telling. I've not heard the FBI deny culpability. I've not heard, uh, The Clintons say we didn't do it. I mean, there's been, I mean, James Carville did what Carville does. He runs interference for the Clintons because he's gotten rich running interference for the Clintons. So you would expect Carville to do his thing, LSU cap and all. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. None of this surprises me, except the American people seem to be divided on how bothered they are that the FBI chose to put its fat ass on the scales to advantage one candidate over another. I mean, that, that, that's... Well, I'm not real surprised at Peter Strzok. I'm not surprised at Andy McCabe. I'm not surprised at James Comey. I mean, they're insiders, and Trump was an outsider, the consummate outsider. Trump ran on drain of the swamp. Well, I mean, when you say drain the swamp, you, you, you get the dander up of Andy McCabe and Peter Strzok and, and James Comey. I mean, James Comey, imagine the, um, the arrogance it takes to know what you did as FBI director and then write a book about leadership and honesty and integrity and truthfulness. I mean, that, that's pretty rich. But, but the reason they're allowed to live these existences is because nobody's holding these people accountable. And the only group of people in America that can hold these people accountable are we the people. And I understand Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, I do believe there are some people that defend Trump, but he doesn't deserve to be defended. I mean, we're humans. I mean, we're emotional creatures. We're not Vulcans. We're not robots. We get called up in in the moment. But the Durham report made crystal clear that the Federal Bureau of Investigation launched an investigation into a presidential campaign on opposition research paid for by Hillary Clinton. They knew it was opposition research, and they did it anyway. And 50% of America believes that's okay. I mean, I've read the comments. I've watched the news accounts. I've talked to people, you know, at the, uh, at the coffee shop, at the donut shop, at the restaurant. People have been convinced that anything associated with Donald Trump is bad. And if we're there, I mean, if we are to a place as a nation where 50% of Americans believe it's okay for the FBI to help decide who gets to win 
the the 2016 presidential election and then the 2020 presidential election, and we've not got to Hunter Biden yet. I mean, if the FBI's made all these corrections, why don't we know more about the Hunter Biden laptop? I mean, the laptop from hell, as Donald Trump likes to refer to it as. But but in closing, I want to say this, and, and I want you to listen as clearly to this as anything I've ever said. Politicians going to politic. Prostitutes going to prostitute. But people who pledge an oath to an office to enforce the rule of law have an obligation to enforce and apply that law equally and without favor. And the FBI did not do that. Did the FBI help steal an election? I don't know. Will the FBI help steal another election? I don't know. But it's unequivocally true and profoundly correct to say the FBI corrupted the 2016 election the 2018 election, the 2020 election, the 2022 election, and if something doesn't change amongst we the people, they'll corrupt the 2024 presidential election. I want to thank our sponsors. Carolina Bank serves communities throughout northeastern South Carolina, offering a wide range of services to meet every personal or business need from straightforward accounts to complex finances. They're prepared to help you reach your financial goals. Carolina Bank, banking on tradition, since 1936, member FDIC Schofields, Ace Hardware, your one-stop shop for all hardware, paint and lawn and garden needs, plus all things sporting goods, including firearms, safes, clothing, footwear, and more. Pepsi of Florence represent the entire product line of PepsiCo, one of the world's leading food and beverage companies. Pepsi of Florence also serve brands from other great companies, such as Dr. Pepper, Canada Dry, Lipton Tea, Gatorade, and various regional brands. Mickey Finn's largest South Carolina liquor wholesaler serving every county in the state. Largest bourbon selection statewide. They ship wines to 43 states opening soon. A new beverage warehouse across from Bucky's on I-95 in Florence. They support USC athletics including Williams Bryce and Colonial Life Arena. Marlboro PD Electric Co-op. If you're in big business and looking for an industrial park in the south, to build your new plant, consider Marlboro PD Electric Co-op's new PD Commerce Center, uh, an industrial park located at the I-95 exit in Florence, South Carolina. Check it out at mpdcoop or pdec.com.